Thank you. Thank you, Federico, for the kind introduction. First of all, I would like to thank really the organizing committee of this conference because uh, it was able to keep it alive even in these uh, very difficult periods, times for especially for the north part of Italy. And uh, especially I would like to thank Elisabetta for inviting me to present these uh, activities that are covering more or less the last three years. And uh, uh, these activities are for a focus on the um, possibility to couple uh, the good uh, uh, mechanical properties of composite material with some functionalities. And specifically, uh, we focus our, our attention on the uh, possibility to induce a, a capability to store and release thermal energy. In particular, the outline of the presentation is the following. Uh, I will first focus the attention on the brief introduction and describe the aim of the project. Uh, and next, uh, I will describe the main result regarding the development of a uh, uh, composite uh, having structural capabilities based on thermosetting material filled with continuous fibers or thermoplastic uh, uh, materials, uh, again filled with continuous fibers. We also did uh, some, uh, some activities on a short fiber enforced composite, but I will not present it in this, uh, in this framework due to, to, to the time restriction. And uh, finally, I will also focus attention on polymeric forms uh, with uh, thermal energy storage capabilities that can be coupled with lamina in order to produce sandwich structures. Finally, I will try to draw some conclusion and some future perspective, and of course, some acknowledgements. The main motivation behind this uh, 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 issue to store energy are uh, mainly related to the possibility to recover energy losses in conversion systems. Generally, the losses are represented by heat, uh, which is uh, lost in the environment. We can have also the need uh, to store the excess energy generated when uh, renewable resources are, are, are available and reuse the store energy when these renewable resources uh, are not available. Lastly, we have also uh, the need uh, sometimes to improve a more efficient way to use energy, therefore reducing the energy consumption, and this is called generally energy management. The type of energy that we can store uh, is uh, uh, of different type. Uh, in, for example, we can have chemical energy that can be stored in hydrogen or in synthetic natural gas or as a biofuel. We can have uh, electrochemical energy, generally stored in batteries or in cool cells, or we can have electrical energy that we can store in supercapacitors or in capacitors or in superconducting magnetic storage device. Also, mechanical energy can be stored. Examples are flywheel systems or pump magnetic storage system or compressed air systems. Thermal energy is the focus of this uh, presentation. We can store thermal energy in different ways as a sensible heat, latent heat, or in thermochemical systems. For us concerned the thermal energy storage, there is, a, to my opinion, a quite interesting classification provided by Abbath in uh, 1983. Uh, starting from uh, looking at the material we can use for the thermal energy storage, we can look at the principle behind uh, this uh, uh, capability. So we can use sensible heat, latent heat, or chemical energy. For us concerned, the latent heat, which is the focus of this presentation, we can exploit different phase changes, liquid to gas, solid to gas, solid to liquid, or solid to solid. Here, we will focus, due to the type of temperature range, uh, which, uh, which is actually the target, to solid to liquid transition. And uh, specifically, we can have two types uh, of uh, materials, organics or inorganics. For us concerned, organics materials, the main use are paraffins, uh, mostly alkane mixture, fatty acids, and esters. We can also have uh, inorganics, uh, uh, phase change materials, which are hydrated salts, metal alloys, or eutectic compounds. Uh, in this presentation, we will mostly focus on uh, paraffins, uh, all together, these uh, materials are called phase change materials. These uh, PCM, uh, phase change materials, are mostly represented by paraffin boxes, polyethylene glycols, fatty acid, 
which are the most in use for low mid temperature range, which typically ranges from minus 20 up to 120 degrees. The advantages of this uh, system, organic, solid liquid uh, phase change materials, are the high enthalpy per unit mass uh, that can reach uh, up to 250 joule per gram, the tunable working temperature, which is related to the possibility to change the molecular weight. They have generally good thermal stability, chemical inertness, they are congruent melting, and uh, they are a negligible supercooling. And very important, they have characterized by a relatively low cost. For us concerned the disadvantages, they are characterized by relatively low thermal conductivity, which is, can be a problem, of course, and uh, more importantly, the leakage above the melting temperature that has to be prevented somehow. The main uh, tools uh, or uh, strategies that we have to prevent this leakage are currently, currently represented by encapsulation, so we can uh, uh, encapsulate our PCM in a core sorry, in a shell, which is generally a um, thermosetting material like phenol formaldehyde resin, for example, or inorganic shells. Another possibility is to make a shape stabilization of the PCM uh, by intercalating the material in porous media, like layered materials or inorganic nanofillers, which are generally characterized by high specific surface area. The application of phase change materials are characterized mainly by the temperature in which uh, the heat is stored, which is basically during uh, uh, the phase in which the material is, uh, is molten. So we have a solid to liquid transition in which uh, a latent heat is stored in the material. And then during cooling, we can have a uh, uh, a solidification, uh, a crystallization generally of the material, which is uh, uh, the, phase, the, the step in which the material can be released. So we can have uh, application like storage of thermal energy. This is typically done when uh, during uh, time of excess energy production, some of that thermal energy can be actually diverted into a storage system when it can be kept for a later use. In this uh, uh, work, we mainly focus on this second possibility, which is a so-called thermal management. So thermal energy is absorbed into the phase change material in order to prevent overheat in elsewhere in the system. The overall effect is to smooth temperature variation. Here you can see the typical situation in which storage uh, of thermal energy is required. For example, in a solar power plant during the day, we have a very sort of high surplus of the solar energy, uh, of the thermal energy produced by the system, uh, and a very uh, a, and a relatively low demand. And therefore, this excess of energy can be stored, uh, for example, by using phase change materials. This is a typical scheme of a plant in which the excess of energy produced during the day is used to uh, molten a uh, PCM, which at the end can be used to heat water for domestic users or to refill the plant itself. Uh, thermal management uh, uh, here is uh, actually one of the first uh, application of uh, this concept to buildings. In fact, in igloos, uh, we can uh, basically use ice as a building material. And uh, in this way, we can uh, have an internal temperature in this construction, which is generally between 9 and 15 degrees. Even if outside, uh, the temperature can be very harsh, down to minus 40, even minus 45 degrees. This concept has been now uh, tried to be translated to real cost modern constructions for example, by using clay bricks, uh, which are including PCM in the inner part. This uh, uh, can be also done in different parts of the house, such, in, such as in the roof, uh, like in this example. So in this construction details, uh, in which uh, basically uh, two PCM insulation systems are produced, uh, and uh, this enhanced uh, foam and PCM impregnated fabrics are used to insulate the roof. Here on the right, you can see the effect. So by using uh, a metal roof uh, with cool uh, roof surface, you can uh, save 70% of the uh, energy in this case. 
And uh, uh, by using PCN, you can increase this amount down to 90%. So there is a net gain of more than 20, of about 20% in this case of the energy you can save. Therefore, um, the idea behind this work uh, is to develop multifunctional composites, uh, which can uh, effectively uh, um, have a role as structural material, and at the same time, to induce, uh, to, uh, induce a thermal regulation of the system. Example of multifunctional composites are several nowadays. One example, which is uh, quite recent, is the trial, uh, which is especially performed in the Northern Europe, to develop uh, cardboard panels that can simultaneously serve as structural material and also to store uh, uh, electrochemical energy. And this is actually one example of activities which are currently running in this field. The technological business level, TRL, of this uh, multifunctional composite is, of course, different depending on the specific functionality which is in use. For us, concerned thermal and electrical conductivity, and also embedded sensor, the TRL is quite high. We are very close to uh, application of this material in real structure. For us, concerned actually the um, so called uh, energy harvesting, energy storage, we are here. As you can see, the technological readiness level is relatively low. So there is quite a lot of work to do to rise this TRL to values which are compatible with application, or at least some prototypes. So our work is actually uh, in this field, in this field. The possible uh, application uh, where weight and volume saving are key issue are actually the following, and in particular, we are thinking to the automotive field, in which uh, the temperature regulation in the cockpit uh, can be very important, and also not only for civil, but also for military application. Uh, electronics, uh, here it's quite important to avoid overheating. It's quite a common experience to have a phone uh, that can uh, uh, rise the temperature during the day in a, in a quite uncontrolled manner. It would be nice to have a cover or a system in the phone that can prevent the rise of the temperature over certain levels. Uh, smart technical equipment, body temperature regulation. Uh, here, for example, you can see a helmet, but there are also fabrics that can be uh, actually used to uh, regulate the temperature of the body. And also de-icing systems. For example, there are uh, quite large projects currently running on the possibility to use phase change materials to prevent the formation of ice on the blades. Here, the principle is that the blade during the day can store thermal energy that can be eventually released during the night in order to avoid the formation of surface. In this case, it is enough to have a surface temperature higher than zero degree. So the aim of the project is to develop multifunctional polymer composite and forms with good mechanical properties and also the capability to store and release heat. We actually are aiming at developing this kind of structures, the so-called sandwich structure, in which there are laminae in the outer layer. And in this case, the laminae will contain also PCM and also forms in the middle, generally uh, rigid forms, but in some cases, we can also use flexible forms, uh, which are also containing PCM. In the first part, uh, I will describe the results we obtain on this called thermosetting structural composite, which are actually probably the most common in some fields, uh, like the aerospace and uh, also the automotive field. And uh, these are some, uh, uh, the, the results are mainly summarized in the manuscript that you can see listed here. Uh, in the first, uh, um, at the beginning, we started to uh, ask ourselves how to uh, actually immobilize paraffin to reduce the mobility of paraffin in the molten state. And one uh, effective solution was provided by the use of carbon nanotubes in form of bundles. They can uh, actually absorb quite a lot of paraffin and they can immobilize the paraffin when the temperature rises. So we prepare this shape stabilizer PCM. We actually uh, mix uh, this uh, uh, material, with this uh, uh, shape stabilizer PCM in an epoxy resin, and then we prepare some uh, sample for testing. Uh, we also use the same material to prepare, actually by using hand like half and vacuum bagging, some uh, uh, laminate, some laminates, uh, which uh, at the end were cured and finally were tested. Uh, 
So we have actually a matrix in this case, which is containing TCM. Here you can see the uh, typical results we obtain on the epoxy, the neat epoxy field with TCM. You can recognize the, the brittle, uh, which is characterized, the brittle fracture, which is characterized by a very smooth uh, surface, which is the, the epoxy, and the wax, uh, which is characterized by a more rough uh, surface, so you can distinguish the epoxy from the wax. Uh, as you can see, there is quite an intimate contact, so the apparently there are no uh, remarkable debonding, even after fracture. The amount of wax was changing from 20, 30, up to 40%. Of course, uh, uh, the main tool here is DSC, differential scanning calorimetry. You can see how the neat resin, actually, uh, here is the heating. The neat resin is characterized only by the glass emission temperature around 90 degrees. Why, when uh, wax is added, you can see there is a melting point and a crystallization actually peak here, which is actually uh, storing and releasing heat, in this case at a temperature which is around 44 degrees. Uh, which is uh, important is the uh, repeatability of this uh, uh, situation because uh, the thermal cycles during the life of a component are uh, very elevated. So we uh, run this experiment up to 50 cycles, and as you can see, they are practically overlapping. So there is no um, effect of these thermal cycles on, on the uh, capability to respond to the material. Mechanical properties, we did uh, some characterization, and we immediately realized by very simple three-point bending test that there is a, a strong effect of this uh, uh, PCM on the mechanical properties, specifically there is a decrease of the tensile modulus and also a decrease uh, uh, of uh, the uh, stress of break in this material. Next, then we move to the preparation of laminates. Here you can see the typical epoxy carbon fiber laminate. You can recognize the fibers which are longitudinal and the fibers which, which are transversal to the plane. And uh, uh, the situation when also wax, uh, in this case PCM uh, stabilized with carbon energy, was added. Here we can recognize uh, a difference in the interlaminar region, uh, which is becoming more evident when the uh, PCM amount is rise to 30 percent. Here in the interlaminar region, you can recognize the fibers here and here the epoxy with the uh, PCM located in more or less in this interfacial region. And the same when the wax is increased up to 40%. So the PCM phase is potentially distributed in the interlaminar region, and there are quite large domains, probably due to the coalescence of the raising of the wax, sorry, during the curing of the composite. DSC uh, was also performed. Uh, the good news is that the uh, thermal energy storage and release effect is preserved, or even in the composite materials. Here you can see a typical value that we were able to reach. In particular, the highest is about 36 joule per gram, which corresponds to almost 50 joule per cubic centimeter, which is a relatively high value for this system. And also the repeatability and of the uh, thermal cycles is preserved at least up to 50 cycles, which was the highest number of cycles that we simulated in our DSC. Uh, the thermal conductivity measured by a laser flash analysis was also affected, and uh, in particular, uh, when the PCM content is increased, also the thermal conductivity increases, which is good, and this effect is related to the presence of carbon nanotubes uh, in the PCM, which is a highly conductive material. A very simple experiment can highlight the advantages of using uh, uh, this PCM inside a laminate, this is an, uh, an example in which uh, basically the laminate was kept at 60 de degrees C, which is a temperature higher than the melting point of the wax, and then left to cool down to room temperature. Here you can see the cooling curve of the neat epoxy carbon fiber laminate, which uh, rapidly cooled down to room temperature. On the other hand, when the PCM is present, there is a kind of plateau, and then the temperature gradually goes down. So it takes a much longer time to reach the same temperature. This uh, can be done, this very simple experiment can be done even on heating. And on heating, you can see there is a delay of the heating, which is represented by the melting of the PCM. And then in order to reach uh, the temperature of the oven, we take a much longer time. 
This, uh, in practice, represents uh, a much higher thermal inertia for the system, which means that uh, it looks like we have a much thicker laminate, and uh, uh, this preserves the temperature uh, at a given level uh, much better than the neat laminate. For us to the mechanical properties, we also perform a, a three-point bending test. And uh, what we found, uh, a good news is that the elastic modulus is more or less preserved. There is a decrease, but is not dramatic. Uh, what is really decreasing is the strength, which goes down for 700, down to uh, close to 200 uh, megapascal. So this is the point uh, we have really to work uh, to optimize. Uh, another point, uh, which is uh, uh, quite important to analyze, is the so-called interlaminar shear strength, which is basically the maximum shear stress the laminate can sustain. Here, there is a standard uh, that we can use uh, to measure this property uh, by using short beam shear test. As you can see, this property initially was 50 megapascal, and then it's decreasing when the paraffin centicontin in the matrix increase. And this is another weak point in the laminate that can be uh, actually improved. For us to observe the dynamic mechanical thermal analysis, it is very interesting to observe how the storage modulus of the neat epoxy carbon fiber laminate has a drop in corresponding to the glass transition, while in the presence of uh, uh, the PCM, there are two drops, uh, one corresponding to the melting of the PCM, which is represented by the split in the, in the loss modulus, and then another peak corresponding to the glass transition temperature of the epoxy. Of course, uh, the storage modulus uh, as a function of the volumetric entropy, so this is the structural property, this is the functional property of the laminate, are correlated, and uh, uh, the higher is the volumetric entropy, the lower is the storage modulus. Of course, the strength is different if you are uh, below or above the melting point of the PCM. The next topic is uh, correlated to the first one, but uh, we move to so-called thermoplastic structural composites. This kind of material has uh, becoming more and more important in the industry related to uh, composite material due to the potentially higher recyclability, but more importantly to their higher toughness. So they are uh, basically more resistant to impact conditions. What we did here is to select a uh, a matrix, in particular this helium, which is a product by Akima, is a um, metacritic resin, which is liquid at room temperature and then can react uh, by uh, giving a solid resin, and uh, which is thermoplastic. So at the end, uh, you can use the same, we can use the same techniques uh, that we can use for thermosetting polymers, and uh, so there is no need to change the plane. But at the end, we end up with a thermoplastic uh, based composite material. In this case, we didn't use uh, the paraffin uh, uh, stabilized with carbon nanotubes, but we selected a uh, capsule from capsules, which are uh, basically micro capsules of paraffin encapsulated by a uh, phenol formaldehyde resin. The melting temperature was 45, and the uh, latent heat was 280 joules per gram. We mix uh, this component. And then we produce uh, by casting in silicon molds some samples by polymerization and heat treatment. The same resin was also used uh, in coupling with a carbon fabric to produce uh, by wet layup uh, and uh, some laminates that were finally polymerized and thermal treated. Here we can see the typical structure of uh, microstructure of the matrix. Uh, in particular, you can recognize the capsules. There are empty capsules, but some of them are still full with the wax. And uh, the adhesion between the surface of the capsule and the epoxy and the helium resin is quite good. And uh, here we can see basically there is also some um, mass loss uh, during uh, the preparation because this helium resin is very volatile. So in our setup, uh, we were not able to capture and to keep uh, actually this all the resin inside the mold, but still we can uh, have a very quite large amount of capsule in the system. The thermal behavior uh, is uh, typical of the system with a melting and then a, a crystallization. And uh, the area under the peak is represented by this uh, quantity which are reported here. 
quite interesting here, you can reach values which are close to 100 joules per gram, which are among the highest you can find in the literature in this difference. The effect on the mechanical properties, here you can see the bending test. There is a also in this case a decrease uh, of the tensile of the flexural modulus, and then also a very strong decrease of the strength. We prepare also the laminates, and uh, uh, also in this case, you can recognize the presence in the interlaminar region of these capsules. So they are preferentially located in the interlaminar region. Here is a, a magnification of an optical microscope, my microscope in which you can found, you can look at the fibers, which are parallel or perpendicular to the cross section. And in the middle, in between the layers, in the so-called interlaminar region, you can recognize the capsules and the matrix, uh, which is binding together the fibers. Also, scanning electron microscopy confirmed the presence of uh, uh, a concentration of capsule in the interlaminar region. And uh, this can have an effect, of course, on the mechanical properties. So it would have been better to distribute the capsule over in the entire cross-section of the composite material. But this was not possible uh, depending on the techniques that we use. Another confirmation of the presence of the capsule in the interlaminar region. As you can see, a magnification, we can recognize the single capsules, which are actually uh, preferentially located between the layers of fiber. For us to observe the thermal properties, it is also here interesting to observe the melting and the cooling, so we can preserve the efficiency of the capsule, even in the composite materials. And the, in this case, the maximum uh, enthalpy that we can exploit uh, is for 40% of capsule, and it's about 66.8 joules per gram. Also, in this case, a very simple test can highlight uh, the difference in the cooling behavior for a neat laminate and a laminate containing 40% or 20 or 30% of microcapsules. As you can see in this case, in order to reach room temperature starting from 70 degrees, it takes more than 20 newtons higher in terms of time, uh, the laminate with 40% of capsule with respect to the neat laminate. And this is a very huge advantage in terms of thermal regulation in case of need. The mechanical properties, three-point bending, even here, there is a decrease of the elastic modulus and a slight decrease of the, uh, or a decrease, sorry, of the, of the strength. And therefore, this is again a point that we should try to solve and that we are working and try to solve this point. Dynamic mechanical analysis, this is quite interesting because here you can see again the thermal transition, the melting of the microcapsules and also the glass transition of the helium resin. If we highlight uh, this region and we give and we do a uh, test of different frequency, you can see how this peak uh, of the melting of the wax inside the capsules is asymmetric. So there is a very strong frequency effect uh, when the wax is in the solid state. When the wax is molten, here is the DSC, so you can see that at this temperature the wax is completely molten, this frequency effect is practically lost. So we are moving from a basically a uh, rubber state uh, to a liquid state in this case, and therefore the effect can be explained in this way. Uh, given this effect on the frequency, it is also possible to measure uh, activation energies for these uh, transitions. Here, for example, you can see by an Arrhenius plot, we can measure the activation energy for the glass transition of the helium resin. Uh, the glass transition of the helium resin, or we can measure also the uh, activation energy for the melting process of the wax. And as you can see, the values are remarkably different uh, in terms of activation energies. Uh, another material we started, which is still a thermoplastic material, is glass, nylon 12. Uh, nylon 12 is quite interesting nowadays, especially for the possibility to obtain this material from renewable sources. And uh, uh, glass is another type of fiber which is widely used as a reinforcing fiber in composite materials. Here we selected two different PCM, a micro encapsulated PCM provided by Microtech, 
uh, temperature of melting 43, the particle size is typically one, uh, around 20 micron, and the phase change entropy is 208. And then we also use our paraffin wax uh, stabilized uh, with carbon nanotubes. The melting point is more or less the same, 44 up to 48. The phase change entropy is a little higher, 1,000. Uh, 217, and then uh, we cryomyled this uh, uh, material in order to get particles. Here you can see uh, the heating and cooling phase for these two PCM. As what's concerned the preparation of the composite materials, we started from uh, uh, chips of uh, polyamides. We added uh, in the melt compounder at 200 degrees. Here you can see the, the um, processing conditions. Next, uh, we prepare actually uh, by using a hot press some plates and finally some matrix plugs. Uh, of course, in the compounder, we also added the wax or the microcapsules. And here you can see the composition that, that we investigated. In this case, we were able, able to reach up to 60% of uh, PCM in the material. Uh, for us to start the laminate production, we started by combining the glass uh, in form of a fabric with the matrix plux. Uh, and uh, we, you can see here the unconsolidated laminate, constituted by five laminate in this case, hot press, uh, and then we consolidate the laminate. And here are the properties in terms of white content and fiber volume fraction, which is typically higher than 50% as required for this kind of applications. For us concern uh, the microstructure uh, of the matrices, you can, you can recognize the PR12 and the capsules, which are actually quite good bonded together. And here you can see the paraffin CNT in the same matrix. Uh, in this case, you can see some uh, holes uh, between the paraffin and uh, the matrix. For us concern the thermal behavior, we also, of course use DSC. And uh, the most inter interesting topic uh, feature here is that there is a marked difference between the melting entropy we can reach with capsules in comparison with the melting entropy we can reach with the neat paraffin stabilized with carbon nanotubes. As you can see here, the values in the second case are much lower, which means that we are losing uh, some wax during the process. You have to remember that we reach 200 degrees in the mixer, so this temperature can uh, even degrade probably the wax. Uh, but for sure, we, did, we, had, we had a leakage of this, of, of this uh, material during the process, which is not the case for the capsules. In the case of the capsule, we can preserve basically most of the capsule. Here is the efficiency. So in this case, we were able to reach uh, an efficiency which is between uh, uh, 64 and 77 percent, which is quite good for this process. For us, uh, the, the rheology of the system, we use a melt through index. Uh, to quantify how the capsule content is affecting the melt fluid index. It is, of course, decreasing, but still we can have a material that can be used uh, in terms of rheological properties for uh, actually this kind of application. For us to set the paraffin with carbon nanotubes, uh, most probably due to the presence of carbon nanotubes, there is a strong decrease of the melt fluid index, which means an, a very strong increase of the viscosity. At a given point, it was not possible to do the measurement under this load. We had to increase the load to measure something. So that means that the material is very difficult to be processed. Laminates, of course, uh, we investigated the macrostructure. Uh, here is glass, so that's uh, you can see actually the difference with respect to carbon. And the thermal behavior, in this case, uh, by using a capsule, uh, it is possible uh, actually to have uh, a quite uh, um, high melting entropy. Here are the properties of uh, basically the, the materials. Uh, it is interesting to observe that now we can preserve the mechanical uh, uh, properties, at least in terms of modules, and then we have a more slight decrease of the uh, stress of break when capsule are used. When paraffin carbon nanotubes are used, we have a decrease of both modules and strength. Therefore, an optimal situation can be represented by the use of capsule, at least for this kind of specific matrix, which is again uh, 9 and 12. For us to serve also the short beam shear test, which uh, is uh, uh, needed to evaluate the interlaminar shear strength, ELSS, 
uh, you can see the, how these properties is substantially preserved when capsule are used. On the other hand, we have a decrease of this property when paraffin carbon additives is used as PCM. Here, uh, we try to summarize the result of this part in terms of a kind of a merit plot in which you can see the elastic modules, which is the structural properties, as a function of the melting entity in gel per gram. In all systems we investigated, some of them were not presented in this, uh, in this uh, lecture, but uh, uh, in all cases, uh, you can notice a decrease of the elastic modules when the melting entropy is increased. And uh, we can cover different uh, ranges of elastic moduli depending on the system, and we can induce uh, melting enthalpies that can reach uh, very high values, up to 65 uh, joule per gram, uh, or in some cases, relatively low values, depending on the system that we investigate. The last uh, topic, if I have time, I should have some time left, uh, is related to polymer. You have, you have five minutes left. Five minutes, so I have to run. <laughs> okay. Uh, in this case, uh, we try to prepare some polymer forms uh, by using polyurethane, for example. Uh, we collaborated with a company uh, in, in this project, and uh, we used paraffin and also microcapsules. In this case, the temperature was lower, the melting point is way around 20 degrees, because uh, actually they were interested to a different uh, uh, thermal management. We mix uh, the polio, the resonate in the PCM, and uh, after curing, we get some forms by using both uh, wax and also PCM. Here is the structure. The interesting feature here is uh, that uh, the capsules uh, of PCM are located basically in the walls uh, of the, the folds, and therefore uh, they are not uh, lost uh, inside uh, the, 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 the pores of the folds. For us concerned, the thermal behavior, again, we use DLC, and uh, even in this case, we reach quite high value. 36.3 in one case, and, and we, by using capsule, we reach uh, also 70.5. There's a poster on this subject, so I can skip some details uh, by given by Francesco Galvanini in this conference. Uh, the last uh, uh, type of foam that we investigated was a APDM foam, uh, so it's a rubber. We use some foaming agents and uh, also paraffin wax uh, with a melting point of 20, 21 degrees. Uh, basically, these are the um, foaming agents that we use. I don't have time to go into the details. They are different by the principle they are actually using to create the foams. And uh, the structure uh, is also different. Uh, so depending on the foaming agent, you can get different structures. It is interesting to say that paraffin is always located within the elastomeric matrix, and therefore we can preserve also the paraffin uh, in, uh, in the walls uh, of the foam. For us concerned, the structure, the microstructure of the foam, we can have different uh, uh, situations. OP stands for open porosity, CP is closed porosity, and then P dot is a total porosity. So depending on the foaming agent, we can have an open or a closed cell porosity, which is affecting, of course, the thermal properties. The thermal behavior, by using DSC, you can see that we can reach a very high value in terms of joule per gram, 63.1 and 67.2. The mechanical properties are different depending uh, whether we are testing the material at a low temperature, like in this case, in which the specific modulus is increasing with the PCM content, or below, or sorry, or, or temperature higher than the melting point, in which, of course, the modulus is decreasing when the PCM content is increased. In conclusion, uh, in application where weight and volume saving are important parameter, it is advantageous to combine structural function and thermal energy storage function in the same material. And this can be done by developing multifunctional polymer composites. In this uh, uh, path, we investigated different systems, uh, including carbon fiber reinforced laminate with epoxy or reactive thermoplastic liquid metacrylate system, glass fiber reinforced, with, um, reinforced polyamide laminates, and also other composites such as epoxy short carbon fiber and fully biodegradable starch with composites that I didn't have the time to, to present. 
Uh, future activities are um, a collaboration that we recently started with a, a colleague in Melbourne, in which uh, they are facilitated to prepare sandwich composite where we send our material and they are now preparing sandwiches that will be tested. And then uh, um, also uh, we will move forward on elastomer with thermal uh, energy storage capabilities because they are interested for possible application in civil construction and consumer goods. Okay, this is a picture of the last uh, pre-COVID meeting. And, uh, I don't know if we will be able to do it soon, but I really hope, and I would like to thank uh, uh, all the group, um, you know, the Polymers and, the and Composite Laboratory, and also uh, the sponsor of this activity, specifically No Urania, which is a company um, in the Trentino and uh, Iveco Defense Vehicles, and also an European project, uh, which is uh, the ROPCM project uh, for supporting this activity. And of course, uh, all the audience uh, for uh, all of you for the attention. Thank you. I basically, I think I've done. Yes, you, thanks for staying in time and for this very interesting presentation. I, I shall look if there are questions on the website. Uh, I don't see any, so we have time for only short one question and we'll ask one. So, uh, what do you think the loading limit of 40% is uh, Is a threshold that you can increase? Meaning, if you want to increase the PCM content, maybe you can go higher, or the detrimental losses in mechanical properties will be too much? Uh, well, this is a good question. And by using this technique, uh, I frankly think that uh, there is no uh, room to increase the, the content because we are very close to the percolation threshold and probably we will have a, a, of, a kind of phase inversion and therefore it will be impossible to keep the particles together. Um, there are possibility mainly probably to use a uh, hollow fibers in which we can maybe uh, try to feel some uh, uh, PCM, uh, but uh, frankly speaking, there are no uh, much, uh, so much so good possibility to go farther than 40, maximum 50%, my weight. Okay, I see, thank you.